we're going to start with the cardiology chapter and uh, as paramedics it's going to be one of the most important and uh, one of the most vital chapters uh, for you especially when you're dealing with cardiovascular emergencies when you're dealing with heart attacks when you're dealing with cardiac arrest so a lot of the anatomy physiology here is important to um, not only uh, understand but you will definitely be implementing a lot of this in the field so first let me just outline some of the basic uh, AMP right so here we have the heart as it sits in the thorax right and the some of the things I want to point your attention to the top of the heart this this portion here is called actually the base and the bottom portion of the heart here is called the apex uh, I don't um, I don't know if you may have heard there's something called the apical pulse how do we get the apical pulse if you take your stethoscope right and you put uh, so this is your clavicle right and it's mid clavicular line fifth intercostal space so we go up to the fifth intercostal space and you place your you know stethoscope here uh, and you auscultate right you get direct uh, auscultation of the heart sounds right you hear lub dub lub dub right so that's the apical pulse that you're listening to and it's probably one of the most uh, accurate ones that you could obtain on your patient right so the reason it's called apical pulse is because you're getting the apex of the heart right and uh, the top portion of the heart is called the, the base of the heart so these terms will be important uh, to keep uh, in mind going forward right? so now the way the heart sits uh, in your thorax here they show you kind of the wrist here right so the wrist corresponds to the base of the heart so this this will be the top and here we said was the apex and here they show you how the heart is surrounded the by the uh, essentially the pericardium right uh, and uh, there is uh, uh, some function to it it uh, offers some cushion there's also some fluid there right the pericardial sac that uh, envelops the heart uh, and you see right uh, this heart is basically sitting here like so um, the space especially the pericardial cavity right uh, where it might become important if for example uh, you heard of a condition called uh, pericardial tamponade, right? Anyone heard of that? Can anyone tell me what is pericardial tamponade? Uh, the, the sac around the heart, it holds like 50 milliliters of fluid, but it fills up to like 150 and it uh, it, it makes it difficult for the heart to beat. Yeah. Or I don't actually know. So Syed, you, you are right on the right track, but how, how uh, I can uh, decide for, or make a distinction between pericardial fusion where there's fluid there and then pericardial tamponade what is the difference can you tell me because if i say pericardial fusion it could still go with your definition right with fluid accumulating here it could, the fluid could be blood could be serious fluid and, you know cancer patients can develop it could be secondary to trauma right and how does that differ from let's say pericardial tamponade are they the same i'm gonna guess it becomes pericardial tamponade when it interferes with like the heartbeat maybe yeah, uh, not really the heartbeat. You're on the right track, but basically, if you guys heard about the Bax triad, right, uh, where not essentially, that, that sounds. yeah, where, where the fusion, a fusion, it's accumulation of fluid, or it could be, you know, uh, uh, blood or uh, anything else in that space, where it's accumulating to the level, right where it's causing patients to exhibit the Bax triad signs and symptoms, right, which would be, uh, you know, low blood pressure, muffled, muffled heart sounds. Uh, uh, and essentially what happens in that setting, right? They're transitioning from uh, compensating to going to a shock. So being uh, tamponade being right, obstructive shock. So the moment that fusion transitions to the point where the patient is exhibiting signs of shock, that's when we call it tamponade. And usually it will be evidenced by the back, back triad uh, that the patient will experience. Uh, back was uh, one of the surgeons, right? Cardiac surgeons. And so they named it after him. So good. So this is the the sac that's that's around the heart. Now the heart uh, has several layers, right? And if we uh, start uh, from inside out, right? So here, imagine this is where the blood will be. So here, blood makes direct contact with this side of the heart, and this side of the heart is the endocardium. And as we make our way, right, uh, from inside towards the outside, the next wall after the endocardium, we have the myocardium. 
myo being muscle, right? Cardium heart. So that, and you notice the, how big it is. And that makes sense for us as well. Why? Because um, for the heart to pump all the blood to the body and to the lungs, we need that muscle tissue in order to facilitate, right? That pumping uh, contraction. And uh, at the very end, right? You have uh, essentially the pericardium over here, right? And where you have the pericardial fluid and the pericardial cavity that surrounds the heart. Uh, and uh, I'm going to show you um, slides going forward, but the left ventricle, right? The, the myocardium portion of it is much thicker and bigger. And the reason why that is, is because that's pumping to the systemic circuit as opposed to the myocardium on the right ventricle, right on the right heart, which is pumping, pumping to the pulmonary circuit. Uh, pressure in the lungs is uh, much less compared to the pressures that you find in your uh, aorta. So you don't need as much of size of the tissue in order to facilitate pumping, right? But uh, on the left side, you need, you need that size in order to facilitate that. So that's important to keep in mind going forward, right? how the heart contracts actually these muscle layers that you see here right they kind of churn on each other and the best analogy i could make is if you did manual laundry in your bathtub for example you you uh after doing the laundry you try to wring out your clothes to get the water out that's essentially how these uh muscle layers uh twist on each other in order to facilitate the pumping motion here this is uh, an actual heart that they uh, took the, these muscle layers, right, of the myocardium, and they unraveled it, right, to see, uh, you know, all the all the musculature of it. And you see when you unravel it, how it twists on each other. So when the contraction actually occurs, the contractual phase or systolic phase actually occurs, these layers twist on each other, and that's what facilitates the pumping motion. And the other thing you see here, right, uh, here, I'm going to, this is the right ventricle, RV, stands for right ventricle, LV stands for left ventricle, and you notice the size difference, right? the left ventricle wall is way thicker, right? As opposed to right ventricular wall, which only pumps the blood to the lungs, right? That, and we talked about that. Here you see how they are twisted on each other, right? Another important thing that's very specific to the cardiac tissue is these things called intercalated discs. I'm gonna kind of highlight. This is from an actual uh, uh, cardiac cell or uh, myocyte, right? So you see these intercalated discs that are here. Right, and um, uh, cardiac muscle, right, is also striated muscle, like your uh, um, muscle, right? They all striated, and uh, the reason why they are striated is because they have these actin and myosin filaments, which we talk about in the musculoskeletal chapter, right? And those are the you know make up the contractile units, the sarcomeres here, uh, and intercalated discs. These ones that I uh, circled here, they serve essentially two main functions, right? They they connect cells via desmosomes. So they basically, they don't allow cells to separate. They kind of adhese, they keep them together. And they also uh, provide gap junctions. And these gap junctions, they basically facilitate ion exchange. In the neuro chapter, we talked about specifically sodium channels. We talked about potassium channels. In cardiac cells, all those channels are present. We're also gonna add calcium channels. I'm gonna show you that schematic one more time, but a cell to cell communication, as you see here, right? How that uh, impulse propagates is through these, right? Intercalated discs that have both, right? The desmosomes and they have these gap junctions and specifically these gap junctions is they're basically like electrical windows. Let me kind of draw a schematic for you. So if I have these two cells here, right? Like the myocytes, the gap junction will be basically something like this, right? Where if I have, if I have let's say sodium that came in via channel on this cell, it can trickle in through these gap junctions and it can propagate from cell to cell, right? And it can depolarize the adjacent cells to it. So this is the gap junction here, right? Uh, and, right, intercalated discs, right, that we see in the uh, cardiac tissue, right? It also has the nuclei, right? Uh, and uh, the nuclei being here, and it's also striated um, muscle, right, of, of the actin and myosin filaments. So here, uh, they give you a schematic drawing, right? You see the cardiac muscle cell, 
you see the intercalated discs they're sectioned here right you see the nuclei uh, that are there they also have the mitochondria to provide the needed atp right for the cells uh, we talked about sodium potassium atpases right that require atp right which uh, pump uh, sodium and potassium against their concentrated concentration gradients by the way uh, this is a important concept i just want to emphasize right when we talk about you know let's say sodium and potassium atps right and i was telling you guys that the cells are bags of potassium right in the sea of sodium right so when we have these sodium potassium atpases that are found on the cell surface and when they're functioning they employing atp and and you want to remember uh what's the movement do they what they move in and out let's see if you guys recall what does the sodium potassium atps do i think it attaches to one of the channels and that allows um that allows sodium to come into the cell and then they release uh, i think it's two potassium so it, it's more negative on the inside of the cell rather than um, on the outside of the cell. So uh, let me let me um, re re restate what you're saying. Are you saying that it moves s sodium inside and potassium outside? Yes. Yeah. So the good good thing I asked that. So that actually it does not do that. So what sodium and potassium ATPase does, you notice how it's using energy, right? So at the moment we say sodium potassium ATPase, it means it, it's employing energy. ATP is the uh, currency, energy currency of the cell, right? Makes sense? It's high energy currency of the cell that we employ. So whenever we're employing this um, energy, we're moving, right, uh, these ions against the concentration gradient. So what you're basically doing is you're actually moving three sodium out and you're bringing back two potassium. Why you, why are you doing this? You want it to restore the natural gradient, the negative potential of the cell. And the reason why you need ATP to do that, right, is because what is outside the cell? What is the abundance outside the cell? Sodium. Sodium, right? So we said cells are bags of potassium and I see of sodium. So if if I have to pump out, right, sodium from inside the cell to the outside to restore my gradient, I'm actually doing this, right, not with diffusion, because diffusion is usually movement from low concentration to high, but I'm actually moving this towards the high concentration, so I must supply energy for this process to occur. So sodium potassium ATPase is actually employing energy, right, it's an active process, it's not passive, it's active process, and it's moving against the concentration gradient and it's pumping three sodium out, and it's bringing two potassium inside to restore that negative 90 millivolts resting status of the cell. So this is very, very important. This concept here uh, is gonna become extremely important when we get to the cells, the myocytes, right? And talk about the depolarization of the myocardial cell, right? So um, this is the function of sodium potassium ATPase. And, okay. and then, right, inside the cell, once, these ions are there, as I said, right, they can go from cell to cell via, right, the, the gap junctions, which is part of the intercalated discs, right? So then the, the sodium or the calcium channels, they can propagate from one cell to another, right? So here we see, right, the gap junctions, uh, and we see, right, the desmosomes being the connection, they basically anchor the cells together. Uh, and the gap junctions is basically electrical windows that, uh, move ions across the cells. Now, uh, looking at the actual heart, right? You notice uh, here you have the right atrium, right ventricle, and then on the back surface, uh, it's, it's not really um, shown to you per se, right? But you have the left atrium and you have the left ventricle. Uh, this portion of the heart is truly bigger than this, but the reason why it's presented this way when the heart sits in your thorax, it's kind of twisted. So this is initially, right, what you see. So that's why they presented it like so. Um, some, some of the important things that I wanna highlight, right? You notice uh, left atrium here. And how many 
pulmonary veins does it have? How many connections that you see? Four. Four, right? So, so the all the lungs, uh, uh, specifically, specifically, right? All the oxygenated blood that's coming in to the left atrium, it does this via pulmonary veins, and there's four of them, and they all communicate with the left atrium. So all the blood that's coming from your lungs is going straight to the left atrium. It's oxygenated blood, right? And then it's going to your left ventricle in order to be propelled throughout the body. The other important thing you see here is the coronary sinus is essentially the venous drainage, right? So yeah, the, the heart, it has coronary arteries. That's how it gets its oxygen supply, but it also has veins. And um, uh, they all drain to this coronary sinus, right? And then it's going to go to the right atrium. You also see on the right atrium, the superior vena cava and you have the inferior vena cava. So superior vena cava brings all the blood uh, from the upper portion of the body, your head, right? Your jugular veins, the inferior is from your legs. So they all come into the right atrium. They're bringing deoxygenated blood uh, and it's all coming in through the right side of the heart in, our, in order to then pump to the right ventricle to go to the lungs in order to be oxygenated, right? So some of these important uh, structures here. Now, uh, this is just the heart from the uh, from the cadaver, right? This is an, an actual looking heart as opposed to the picture. You see, right, the left side of the heart is, is way, way bigger, right? As opposed to the right ventricle and the right atrium. So that that's what's important to note here. Uh, basically, the left side is the workhorse. Now, I want to talk about some of the coronary arteries. I'm going to uh, repeat this quite a bit here. Uh, so the reason why they're called coronary arteries, think of it, uh, the heart is like the crown, right? And uh, the heart sits in the crown. That's why they call them the coronary arteries. Uh, coronary arteries supply blood to the heart muscle itself, to the myocardium, right? That we saw, the muscle layer. And they penetrate in, even though you see they kind of go on the surface, right? They, you see them on the epicardial surface, but really they penetrate in. So it, it, start from the, it starts from the epicardium, but they uh, basically go in and in towards the myocardium and towards the endocardium. So they basically supply uh, nutrients and oxygen throughout the whole uh, wall, right? Throughout the whole wall of the myocardium. Uh, now, we also, why is this also important? So the reason why this is also important, there are some correlates with the 12 EDKGs, right? When we look at the 12 lead later on, I'll show you uh, those um, diagrams. We want to correlate where you see elevations or where you see depressions uh, to have an idea which part of the heart may be involved, right? That's how when you transmit the EKG, that's how the, the doctors and the cardiologist can have a rough idea where the MI or um, the STEMI, right? ST segment elevation uh, myocardial infarction is occurring. So let's go through it. Uh, so you see the, the right coronary artery. So this right coronary artery, it will uh, provide oxygen, right? They provide oxygen and uh, nutrients to the right atrium, right? As you see here, and to the right ventricle. And also it will provide to the inferior wall, right? Inferior being the bottom wall uh, of the heart. Uh, this is the right coronary artery, right? So it, there is subdivisions to it that goes into the marginal, but for your purposes, what you need to know, the right coronary artery, it supplies the right atrium, it supplies the right ventricle, it supplies the inferior wall of the heart, the bottom portion of the heart, and it also has blood supply to the SI node and the AV node, right? So SI node, you know, is the, the natural pacemaker of your heart, then it goes to the AV node, and you have branches from the right coronary artery, right, that supply the SI node, AV node. Why is this important? The reason why this is important is, for example, if let's say I develop a thrombus somewhere high up on my uh, right coronary artery, right? And perhaps I cut off uh, blood supply to the SI node, right? Then the next, the, then the SI node may not be functioning well. So the next node that will pick up may be the AV node, right? And from this, you could kind of correlate, right? If you remember the SI node, the, it basically depolarizes at 60 to 100 beats per minute, AV node, right? about uh, 40 to 60 beats per minute. So all of a sudden you come in, right? You see your patient is in bradydysrhythmia, right? Bradycardia. And you see on your 12 EDKG, right? You see that uh, 
uh, you see elevations in a 2-3 AVF and you kind of correlate, okay, I know it's right coronary artery and I, it might be high up. Uh, why? Because this patient is showing me sinus bradycardia. His heart rate is less than 60, right? So you, you could kind of start to piece together, right, where the thrombus may be located. We'll go more in depth a bit later, but I'm just going to give you like a brief overview. So right coronary artery supplies the right atrium, right ventricle, inferior wall, uh, AV node, SA node. And then we see the left coronary, which subdivides into left anterior descending, right? And the circumflex. The circumflex goes uh, to the lateral side, right? To, to this, like around the heart, to the back side of it. We call it the, the lateral wall. And then the left anterior descending, it supplies blood to the septal wall of the heart, and it supplies to the anterior portion of the left ventricle. When, uh, if you guys ever heard uh, uh, of the Widowmaker, anyone heard of the Widowmaker heart attack? Yes. Yeah, so the Widowmaker, uh, why they call it the Widowmaker is because imagine if you have a, a thrombus all the way out here, right? So do you, you do not have good blood flow distally. So this basically can cause an infarct on this entire left ventricle side. And this entire left ventricular side supplies the blood to your systemic circulation, right? To your aorta. And all of a sudden, if you cannot pump the blood, right? Uh, your left ventricle is not pumping well. It's necrotic, right? Because of this thrombus, right? They called it the widow maker because you could die from this uh, type of a heart attack, right? So, uh, and we're going to correlate some of the 12 lead DKGs, right? Usually... V1, V2 are responsible for septal wall, right? This portion here. And then um, going down, right? V3, V4, uh, um, your anterior wall. And then V5, V6, 1, and AVL will be more towards the lateral wall. But there's certainly overlap. And I'll show you some slides uh, that uh, outline that. But uh, for now, right, the left side of uh, the heart is supplied by the left coronary artery. The left coronary artery has two subdivisions. The left anterior dis descending, which is this portion here, supplies the septal wall, right, and the anterior wall of the left ventricle. And then you have the circumflex, which goes back of the heart, and it supplies the lateral side of the heart. And if it's long enough, it can also supply the your inferior wall of the heart. And uh, as you guys know, right, every person's anatomy slightly differs. So some uh, one one guy may have slightly longer you know, uh, circumflex artery, another person may have slightly shorter. So there's certainly going to be slight differences person to person, but overall, uh, that's the, the path they take, right? Now, uh, here we see the, the back wall. So if we twist the heart around and we, uh, follow the circumflex, right? Artery, you see how it's supplying the lateral aspect of the heart, right? And we see, uh, the the right coronary artery, right, how it's going back, and this becomes the posterior descending artery, it supplies the right ventricular side, right? So uh, right ventricular side is also supplied by the right coronary artery. Uh, let me see um, if you guys um, could tell me this question. Um, uh, in terms of your um, preload dependence, right? Preload, which is more dependent on the preload, the right side, the right ventricle or the left ventricle? The left. The left and, and why? I don't know. Okay. Anyone because, dis because anyone, dis the, anyone disagree or group? agree? What was the question? Yeah. Which I side disagree. of- disagree. Which side of the heart I, I is, preload, well. is preload dependent? The right, the right, the right side right. of the heart. And why? Because that's where um, the deoxygenated blood comes from. Yeah. So, so usually the, truly speaking, the right atrium and the right ventricle is where they'll be receiving the blood right from your uh, inferior and superior vena cava. So uh, it will certainly be preload dependent, right? So if you reduce the preload to the right ventricle, yeah, certainly the left side will see it less, right? But um, uh, preload dependence, right? We see it much more pr prominently 
on the right ventricular side. And the reason why I bring this up now, later on, we're gonna learn, right? Especially, you know, a condition where you have inferior wall MI and right side ventricle, right, may be involved. So if the right side ventricle may be involved in a heart attack, this side of the heart is not pumping so well, right? So that's why we wanna be cautious with medications such as nitroglycerin, which cause dilation, right? Uh, venodilation. And if it does venodilation and I dilate my inferior and uh, superior vena cava, right? I make this lumen bigger. Can is there's more blood or less blood coming in now? If I make the if I make the tank larger with my venodilation, less yeah, blood going. Less yeah, blood 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 is not going to be going as well because I drop my blood pressure right in in those sites. And plus we have a right ventricle that's now infarcted that's not pumping well. So you want to be very cautious with nitroglycerin administration in patients who have right ventricular uh, and inferior wall MIs, uh, especially the right ventricular MIs, because if right ventricle is not pumping well and I further drop the blood pressure and increase my uh, right uh, venodilation with this drug, less blood coming in, you will basically bottom this person out. You could uh, potentially kill them by giving this drug. So we'll talk oh, about yeah. more about this later but that's what you want to be cognizant. Right side is more preload dependent. I have a question about that. Sure. Like if we were to bring that patient's blood pressure up with fluids first, then mm -hmm. will, will we be able to safely administer nitroglycerin? So in, in, that, in that setting, you may probably need more than uh, IV fluids. You may probably need IV fluids plus a presser. Uh, and then you, could, you possibly can, yes. We're going to talk about more when we get to the pharmacology aspect of it, but, but potentially, yes. Uh, you, if you brought his blood pressure up with fluids and you gave him a presser, let's say the guy was in cardiogenic shock, then you could potentially provide some nitroglycerin. But in the initial phases, right, when they sustain the heart attack and their blood pressure is low, right, uh, and especially if the right uh, side is involved, you want to be very cautious with your nitrates. Thank you. Yeah. Right. So this is, uh, uh, now we, we talked about the coronary arteries, right? We talked about... Um, the supply of blood flow. Then we also have the veins, right? Which essentially uh, they um, then they pick up all the waste products, right? And we wanna then again, reactionate that blood through the lungs. So uh, they drain into these um, veins. You have the great cardiac veins, you have the anterior cardiac veins, and they drain to this portion here, right? The coronary sinus, which then goes to the right atrium. All right, you see it here. And then the blood gets reactionated going through the right ventricle and to the lungs. All right, so heart has both the arteries and the veins. The, by the way, uh, where in the heart attack, where's the thrombus forming, in the artery or the vein? I think the in artery. The the, it's yeah. definitely the artery, right? It's the coronary artery. It's not the vein, right? Why? Because the blood flow, right? You know, blood flow is distribution is the arteries. So in the heart, right, the heart attack is occurring because there's a thrombus in the arterial side, not the venous side. So that's important to keep in mind, right? So we talked about the veins, right? We talked about the arteries and uh, the walls that they supply. Now... We're gonna talk, I'm gonna uh, briefly discuss the blood flow through the heart. Uh, this, this blood flow, by the way, this blood flow that I have pictured here as it goes through the right atria, right, right ventricle and so forth, is this, is this the blood that's actually supplying nutrients and oxygen to the actual heart? No. No, no, all right, very good. Yes, that, that blood is, that blood in, in itself, right, right to this point is not. Right, the blood that's coming off the aortic arch through the coronary arteries, from the coronary arteries is what's being supplied to the heart muscle itself. But the blood flow that's actually like flowing through these chambers and out, right? Uh, this in itself is not what's supplying the blood flow to the heart. The blood flow that's actually coming through these and it's going inside, right? This is what actually supplies the nutrients. Very important to understand that. Okay, so I'm gonna, uh, sum this up quickly. I made a separate video where I go through this step by step. So if you want in depth uh, info, look at that video. But at the uh, basics, right? So deoxygenated blood comes from the superior 
vena cava from the top portion of the body, inferior portion from the lower portion of the body. It then goes to your right atria, right? From the right atrium, it goes to the right ventricle. There is a um, valve here that separates them, right? It's called the tricuspid valve. So it goes through the tricuspid valve to the right ventricle, and then it makes its way to the pulmonary circuit. The pulmonary circuit being the lungs, right? And it goes through the pulmonary artery. Before it can proceed through the pulmonary artery, there's a pulmonic valve that's there or pulmonary valve. That pulmonary valve needs to open to propel the blood to go to your lungs, right? As the blood is ejected through the pulmonary artery into the lungs, it gets oxygenated, right, through the diffusion process. Uh, uh, oxygen gets loaded on the hemoglobin, on the red blood cell, right? Once it's oxygenated, right, there is four pulmonary veins we talked about, right? We saw the picture. And the pulmonary veins that now have the oxygenated blood, they now drain to the left atria. Through the left atria, right, they go through the mitral valve to the left ventricle. And uh, a good way to remember mitral, right, it's on the mighty side. The left side is the mighty side. And uh, another name for the mitral valve is the bicuspid because it has two cusps. Uh, where they got this name, mitral, it's uh, uh, the name of the pope's or cardinal's head. Uh, it's called the uh, mitre. So that's why they called it the mitral valve, right? And then from the left ventricle, it's going to go to the aorta through the aortic uh, valve, and then it's going to go systemically. Now, the uh, question is when, is, when is the actual blood going to the coronary arteries? Because we just said, right, all of this is not supplying the, the heart muscle itself. What you have is from the aortic uh, arch, right? Let's, I'm going to draw, uh, let me just draw uh, uh, um, aortic valve here, right? So when you have systole, right, the blood is ejected, and you see this is the aortic valve, that kind of opens up from here on the on the actual arch right this is where you have the coronary arteries they come off the aortic arch and they supply you have the right coronary artery you have the left coronary artery right and from these coronary arteries is what the where the heart actually gets it the blood from by the way when when are coronary arteries being filled with blood during systolic phase or the diastolic phase of the heart? And the why? Diastolic phase, the diastolic phase of the heart. And why? Because the aortic valve like push, uh, cover the ostia of the coronary artery when pushing the blood through the aorta. When the Excellent. left vent, ventricle, ventricle push, the, push, the, uh, push the blood through the aortic, aortic arch mm -hmm. they close the opening of the ostia of the coronary arteries yeah no help me is 100 percent on the money right because let me say if this was your uh right coronary artery and this was your left coronary artery let's say they come in from the aortic ostia right what he's saying is during systole when the aortic valve opens right it's going to open like this and when it opens it's going to block the flow of blood into these coronary arteries so during systole no blood can flow back, right? And also remember, I, I showed you the uh, muscle of the heart, how it was churning, right? All these loops. When the muscle is contracting, right? It's under pressure. It makes uh, these muscles contract, acting on myosin filaments, right? These arteries cannot also fill because the muscle is contracting. It's, it's contracting. It's much harder for the blood to fill them. But during diastolic phase, right? What happens is uh, this valve closes, right? And then this blood that now equilibrates back in the aortic arch, then it can backfill these arteries. So remember, very important and very, very important principle, the heart muscle itself, right? This myocardium gets filled during diastolic phase, during diastolic phase, not systolic phase. The reason why it's getting filled during diastolic phase is because aortic valve closes, then the blood can backflow and also it's not squeezing. So there is um, movement of blood through the coronary arteries, right? And as you guys know, right, uh, well, I will ask you this, right? What happens when you have tachycardia, when you have elevated heart rate? Does your diastolic phase increase or decrease? So let's say you have tachycardia, fast heart rate. It, de it decreases. Yeah, your diastolic phase decreases. So if your diastolic phase decreases in the tachyarrhythmias, right, can you really supply blood to your myocardium? No, you cannot. No, you cannot, right? That's why the, the tissue becomes more, the more ischemic it becomes, 
the more ischemic it becomes, the more irritable it becomes. The more irritable it becomes, the more tachy dysrhythmias you may see. So the more tachy tachycardias may be precipitated. So remember, right? Uh, uh, fast fast heartbeats, right? They decrease diastolic phase when the heart is relaxing. And when the diastolic phase is decreased, less blood flow can come into your coronary arteries and supply the myocardium, which then can cause the heart muscle to become irritable and cause further dysrhythmias to occur. Right, very good. Uh, for your exams, right, for your uh, state exam, for your final exam, you definitely must know the flow of the heart, uh, of the of the blood through the heart. You definitely should know the basic coronary arteries, right? Uh, the other important things that I want to outline in this diagram while I have it here, you see these uh, papillary muscles, right? Papillary muscles, these muscles here. And they're connected, right, via chordae tendini to these uh, valves, right? So this is the tricuspid valve. This is the bicuspid valve. You see the same thing, right? You see the uh, papillary muscle and you see the chordae tendini. In uh, certain heart attacks, right, what may happen is uh, that, uh, let's say, the, the left uh, coronary artery, right, is blocked. And that can also cut off blood flow to these papillary muscles. And these papillary muscles can, in fact, become necrotic, right? Uh, and if they become necrotic and they, suff and they suffer basically uh, uh, um, damage, this papillary muscle may rupture. And if this papillary muscle may rupture, this valve may not work as well and it becomes prolapsed. So some patients, right, uh, if they sustain, right, left side heart attacks, if you use your stethoscope and you put it at fifth in the costal space, midclavicular line, like I showed you, right, apical place, you may hear murmurs, right? You may hear murmurs. Why? Because if the heart valve is prolapsed during systole, it doesn't close properly so that you have backflow of blood, right? So if you, if you have a backflow of blood, right, you may hear murmur. Also, where do you think if, if this valve is not functioning well and there's a backflow of blood to the left atrium, where do you think you may hear an additional sounds? Lungs. And what do you hear in lungs? Uh, rails. Rails, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Because if, you, if this valve malfunctions and it's not stopping, right, the backflow of blood, the blood now backs up into the left atria and then goes to the pulmonary veins. From the pulmonary veins, it goes to the pulmonary capillaries and then the blood can come out, uh, and now it's in the lungs. In the lungs, and you hear, you could hear pulmonary edema. So on the, the patients who complain of chest pain, right, you suspect heart attack, right, definitely auscultate, right, in your assessment, auscultate lung sounds for possible of rails, right, crackles, and also auscultate fifth in the costal space midclavicular line for possibilities of murmurs, right? I'm not expecting you to be cardiologist here, but if you know the normal sound is lub dub, and all of a sudden you hear lub, psh, dub, and you hear like whooshing sounds in that uh, systolic phase, something is abnormal, right? So that, you know, could clue you in. Maybe, you know, they have a papillary muscle rupture, right? This can also occur post-procedure if you're doing interfacility transport. You know, patient just got a stent, right? Um, or just had a heart attack. So if you auscultate, uh, you know, they may also suffer from an event such as that, right? So that's important to know. All right. Um, so that's, I think here we covered the most important thing, right? So how do you remember the flow of blood through your heart with all the valves? If you remember, uh, tissue paper, my assets, right? This being tricuspid, pulmonic, mitral, aortic, right? And this is the flow of blood. So it goes, uh, through your heart, right? Just to repeat, uh, it goes right atria, tricuspid, right ventricle, pulmonic, goes to the lungs, right? Uh, then it's coming back from the lungs. It's going to go into the left atria. Left atria bypasses the mitral valve to the left ventricle, through the left ventricle, through the aortic valve into the aorta. So this is a good mnemonic for you to remember, right, going forward. All right, so this is what I was referring to, right? When you make a cross-section of the heart, you see how the uh, right side is much thinner, as opposed to the left side, it makes sense, right? We talked about uh, it's plumbing. This is your systemic circuit, right? Systemic circuit. This is your pulmonic circuit. By the way, is there any conditions that you could tell me where this side, the right ventricular side, 
may become hypertrophied, become big. Heart failure? Um, heart failure? What kind of heart failure? Right-sided heart failure? Right-sided heart failure. And what else? What other common condition can cause uh, right ventricular? Um, EHF. Which one? Just congestive heart failure. Yeah, we just talked about congestive heart failure, but there's another condition that can cause right ventricular hypertrophy. I was going to say pulmonary hypertension. No, and no. Secondary to what? You are correct. Secondary to what? Secondary to, uh, I don't know. Core pulmonary? Core pulmonary is condition. Oh, right, right. Core pulmonary yeah, is a condition okay. when you have right ventricular failure, but the condition that can cause it is? COPD. Very good, right? COPD. So chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Why? Because of the lungs, right? Uh, are narrowing, right? And you have uh, higher pressure in the lungs because of chronic conditions, right? Uh, the right side is now pumping into higher pressure system. So over time, it will hypertrophy. Uh, and those patients, the COPD patients, you may see, right? Core pulmonary, which is right ventricular hypertrophy. And essentially, they it can fail. And, and if uh, there is enough of pressure there, because now it has to pump against the high pressure gradient. So yes, very good. Uh, the other conditions can cause, right? What if you have uh, tricuspid stenosis, right? So the tricuspid valve that you see here, right? Becomes very stenotic. It doesn't open very well, right? It doesn't open well. So you may see right atria hypertrophy, and you could also see that when you have pulm pulmonary stenosis. The pulmonic valve becomes stenotic. So that, that may can cause uh, um, hypertrophy, right? So why? Because if you have pul pulmonary stenosis, it doesn't, it cannot pump against these and has to become large over time. Same thing with the, right, the atrial side, if it's tricuspid stenosis, usually not common. All right. So uh, we talked about, we talked about the valves. We talked about um, um, so, some important things you want to uh, keep in mind, right? Here, they show you the aortic valve and the pulmonary valve. You notice uh, it's three, uh, right? So they also have three cusps. Another name for aortic valve and pulmonary valve is semilunar valves, right? They have three cusps. Sometimes you may have a condition uh, where patients have a bicuspid aortic valve. They're more prone to failure. So a lot of times those patients may go uh, uh, for surgery, uh, you know, if it fails and they'll get aortic valve replacement. But usually they, they have three cusps. Another name for them is the semilunar valves. Uh, by the way, uh, let me ask you this question. Uh, when you hear the sound lub dub, right? Lub dub. Which valves close when you hear that? Anyone yeah. know? Oh, uh, the the, the, oh sorry. You can go. You can go. Now you got it. Go ahead. Go ahead. Anyone can go. All right. All right. So I would say it would it would be the closing of the the mitral and the tricuspid valve. Right. So lob correct. A tri mitral and tricuspid lob, and then uh, what's dub? The semilunar semilunar valves. And and uh, what sound is made when the valves open? Uh, so so what you said is like for for example, let's say you say, you know, we have S one right uh, produced by closure of tricuspid and mitral valve. They close, they make the sound. But my question is, what sound is made when those valves open? When they open, well, yeah, when, when, they, when open. they open, it would be filling, right? It would be filling, yeah. But what sound is made? I'm not sure of the sound. I feel like it's like a whooshing sound. So, so uh, this is. A, Are you talking a, about a S3 or S3? What are they? Yeah. So that that that's a bit of a tricky question because if your valves are healthy, you should have no sound, right? So the opening of the valves produces no sound. Is the closure of the valves? that's producing the sound, right? By the way, uh, you know, uh, if you if you look at the heart, right? Uh, let me just go back to this portion here, right? The actual locations of your, you know, aortic valves 
the auric valve is here, pulmonic valve is here. But when you and your mitral and your tricuspid, but when you if you look at the diagram where they actually auscultate the heart sounds, it's not where they anatomically located. It's not where they are located. If you look on the heart, because when when I take my stethoscope, right, this is where I would look on this side is where I would listen to tricuspid and aortic, and at the bottom portion, the fifth and the costal is where I would want to listen to my right mitral valve. Why is that? They're not listening to the anatomical locations. Uh, they are clueless, like where these are these valves are located. Would it be uh, like an echo against the thoracic space? Um, you're on the right track, but it's not against the thoracic space, but you're on the right track in terms of your thought process. Um, then would it be an echo against the vessels? Uh, not the vessels, uh, but so I'll tell you, you know how you have a guitar, you have the strings and then you have the body, right? So this is actually acting as an amplifier of the mitral. That's why if you put your stethoscope here, right, there's the chambers um, here that will essentially amplify the sound. So it's like kind of like the guitar box, right? Or the sound box where the sound comes in and it amplifies it. That's why your stethoscope is placed not on the actual anatomical location of these valves, but like adjacent to it where the sound is more amplified. So in the aorta, yeah, this will be the, the, the vasculature and the heart will be the actual muscle, the muscle. So good. Um, oh, by the way, um, um, if you want to know the order of uh, auscultation, right? We usually auscultate aortic, aortic, pulmonic, tricuspid mitral. So if, we, if this was, let's say your person, And this was your, your, let me draw a heart like this. Usually we auscultate aortic, pulmonic, tricuspid, and mitral. And an easy way to remember is all physicians take money. So all physicians take money. This is the order of your auscultation for your valves. Aortic, pulmonic, tricuspid, mitral, right? Uh, and yeah, you could certainly have prolapse. You could have a prolapse aortic valve. You have a pro prolapse mitral valve. So depending on the location where you hear that whooshing sound, uh, that could be the, the valve that's involved. All right. So we talked about that. Um, this oh, is just the, yeah. So would that be like V1, V2, V3, and V4? Uh, a little bit. You're close. Uh, I would go, it's a second in the costal space. So you go a little bit higher. A little up. Okay. So a little up from V1 mm -hmm. and V2, and then yeah. V3 and V4 would be the. Yeah. And hey, cool. correct the uh correct v where you have v5 yes fifth in the costal space mid clavicular line yeah got it okay. and yeah, uh, another thing easy. another thing which you want to do is uh you want to have the patient leaning forward and because uh the these are low pitch sounds right uh you may want to use the bell if you have the bell feature of your stethoscope where you turn it over right uh the, like the deep feature use the bell side uh, and you will hear it better so, so basically, listening to that is just ruling out like what, like a murmur and uh, like a tamponade, uh, like listening, listening for listen, a muffled. Listening to that exactly. So, listening to that can give you some clues, right? It can give you clues. Do you have muffled heart sounds? If you're thinking tamponade, it could give you abnormal sounds like clicks, right? Uh, it, uh, uh, or whooshing sounds uh, where you have maybe stenotic valves, uh, or you have a prolapsed valve where there's a whooshing sound. So the the murmur is going. So. Uh, how do you know where it's occurring? You basically have to time it with the diastole and systole. So if I'm palpating someone's pulse and it's, you know, um, I, I can time it into the that face, systole versus diastole, I can say where the abnormal sound is occurring, when the heart is contracting or when the heart is relaxing. And why is that? What's the difference? So we know that when the heart is relaxing, right, which, which valves are open when the heart is in diastole? The, the mitral and the tricuspid. Yeah, the mitral and tricuspid are open, and which valves are closed? The semilunar. The, sem the semilunars are closed, right? So if during diastolic phase, right, you start, during diastolic phase, you start to hear sounds, right, depending on the location, right, depending on the location, like I showed you. So it could be either a click, like a stenotic valve, meaning it doesn't fully open how it should be, because opening of the valve should have no sounds, Right? Or you may have, because these valves are closed and during diastole you hear 
you know, let's say Eurek valve here, you hear bushing sound, it may be the leaflet is going like that and the um, the blood is flowing back. Same thing, you could make a diagram with systole, right? With systole, you have the opposite. You have these valves, the AV valves closed, and then the uh, pulmonic and aortic valves open. So if you can correlate what heart is doing and what valves are doing during systole and diastole and the location, right, of your auscultation here, you, you can figure out which valve is involved and what's going on. But that takes a lot of practice. It's called uh, cardiology fellowship if you want to go into that. Um, well, last thing, sorry. Um, so like at what heart rate does that become non applicable Like, because it's, if their heart's beating that fast, how are you even supposed to tell? Sometimes you cannot. Uh, and uh, uh, <laughs> that, that's why they get an echocardiogram. Gotcha. Right. So uh, I'm not I'm not saying you guys going to be able to like in the field with your stethoscope to do all that. But uh, what you should be able to do is if you hear something abnormal, right, you should kind of see where you where you heard that sound and it should give you some sort some sort of a clue. Right. Where that valve may be. Uh, so just to keep that in mind. Right. We're going to get a little bit more in depth when we do the 12 leads. I'll probably explain on that further. Right. So we talked about all this stuff, the opening of the valves, right? Um, yeah, so so this, this is actually the picture you see here, right? When the valve is closed and this valve is open, you see there is three cusps here, right? And when they're, they're so let's, let's pretend this is your uh, aortic valve. Let's just say this is your aortic valve. So when the there's a diastole, right? Diastolic phase, they close up, so there's no backflow of blood, and this is where if you have the uh, ostia, right? Aortic ostia, where the coronary arteries will be located, and then the blood can, let's say, go through it. During systole, right? You see how they open up? So if you have your coronary arteries here, they will block that blood flow, the blood gets ejected through here, right? And as the pressure drops, then they uh, close back up, right? And this is the same thing, right? We said if there is any damage, right? And there's a prolapse, right? During that phase right here, right? They close during diastolic phase. If during diastolic phase, you put your stethoscope and you hear, right? Uh, whooshing sounds that give you a clue, right? Uh, so this is the, uh, the sounds that I was referring to. Right, so S1 sound, right, this is the first sound. This is your lob sound, right? And this is the closure of your mitral and tricuspid valves. Another name for them is AV valves, right? So AV valves, when they close, they make S1 sound. Uh, S2 sound is the closure of your aortic and pulmonic valves. Uh, another name is semilunar. And by the way, it's not like uh, even though on the diagram I showed you like the blood goes right atria, right ventricle and so forth, right? But in real life, this all happens together, right? Your atria contract and then your ventricles contract. They do it in succession. So atria, then ventricles, both of them, not one or the other. So you have both of, both the closure of these valves. Uh, mitral and tricuspid gives you the S1 sound. The closure of aortic and pulmonic, right? Uh, gives you the S2, right, sound, the dub sound. The opening of the valves, if there's no stenosis, right? If there's if there's not no stenosis present, they should not give you any sound. The the abnormal sounds here, right? They show you S3 and S4. Usually, S3 is uh, a rapid filling, right? Uh, during uh, for your ventricle, this usually signifies uh, <laughs> congestive heart failure. So, if a patient has de developed this, uh, that that's usually significant for congestive heart failure, or they may have developed it. Um, they may have a, like that widow make a heart attack that was proximal in the left anterior descending or uh, the left coronary artery. It took out the entire, entire left ventricle. The patient is in cardiogenic shock, right? And he's developing S3 sound, right? Because why? Because now you have rapid filling and the ventricle is not pumping, right? It's not functional. So it's rapid filling of your ventricle wall. S4 is usually, uh, it's uh, atria is contracting against a stiffened ventricle. So S4 sound is produced against uh, atrial uh, contraction against the stiffened ventricle. When may that uh, happen, right? If you have uh, left ventricular hypertrophy, high, high, you know, high states of hypertension, uh, um, you know, especially 
if you're not taking your medications uh, for your blood pressure, right? So it's atrial filling against a stiffened ventricle will produce S4 sound. Uh, where would you uh, auscultate these? I would auscultate them uh, fifth in the costal space, mid clavicular line, have the patient leaning forward, right? So these are all pathological. So S3, S4 is pathological. Um, S1, S2 is normal sounds. So, you know, I tell you all this, right? So what you want to do is this. Uh, For my experience, if you do this, what I tell you now, you'll gain the best experience. So when you're in the hospital, right, or you're doing inter-facility transport, right? A lot of a lot of EMTs say, oh, you know, I'm doing transport. Nothing you could learn here. So what you do is this. First, auscultate all the patients you get uh, their heart sounds, S1, S2. So you hear normal. And then let's say you're doing inter-facility transport. You look in their paperwork, right? And it says, okay, they have, uh, you know, S2 uh, uh, murmur, or they, they will say they have a gallop. They have a click, right? Uh, so it, it will say in their paperwork, let, let's say they did an echocardiogram for them in the hospital, right? And I don't expect you to know what that sound is, but if you then have the paperwork where the echo has confirmed they have this abnormal sound, use your stethoscope, auscultate the, lung, uh, the heart sounds, and then you hear it and you're like, oh, okay, now, now it kind of makes sense, right? So first, listen to the heart sounds on your regular patients, normal patients who don't have any pathology, and then if you happen to find during your rotations, your clinicals, or your interfacility transport, where the paperwork or the exam has the patient's echo and it says, you know, they have a murmur, they have a gallop, they have a click, right? And they will say systolic, click, diastolic, or whatever the phase of it may be. Use your stethoscope, you know, auscultate. I will say uh, the your mileage may vary depending on the quality of your stethoscope. If you want the best uh, sound, I'll probably get a Litton cardiology grade stethoscope or ADC grade stethoscope where it's not per se the, the brand name, but the, the thickness of the tubing. So the thicker the tubing and the shorter uh, the connection of it, the, the better sa- the heart sounds will be. So cardiology grade, why they're so expensive is the thick, thick tubing. Uh, if you have that cheapo, you know, thin um, one time use stethoscope, you're probably not going to hear any of this. All right. So here they just show you, right, a damaged aortic valve. Uh, you could have, uh, you know, uh, different disease processes that can cause growth, right? Uh, you could have uh, failure where they do replacement for this, right? Um, here they see they're using the pig's heart. Well, why they use the pig's heart? Uh, usually if it's uh, organ tissue, less likely to, to form clots. They also make mechanical valves, right? Mechanical valves uh, is obviously not going to be from uh, tissue. Uh, More likelihood of you forming uh, clots, right? And you're going to be on uh, lifetime supply of anticoagulants, right? Because what what do you think? Where do you think if you have, let's say, a a metallic mechanical valve, aortic valve, and there is some clots that forming around it. Where do you think that clot may shear and go? The lung. Maybe, maybe to the right. artery, the coronary right. artery. The which artery? The circumflex artery, um, the coronary one. So, so remember, right, when the, it, it can, but usually unlikely, usually unlikely. Usually when it will shear off, it will go up in the circulation and the aortic root, right, uh, the aortic arch, I should say, the auric arch it goes into the carotid arteries. So if you have uh, a thrombus that shears off, it may go and give you a CVA or a TIA, depending on you know how big the clot is. So that's the worry. That's why they give them anticoagulants, um, especially if you get uh, you know mechanical valves. All right. Um, so uh, any questions up until this point? Yeah, actually, I did have one, uh, but yep. it was like from early in the lecture. You were talking about uh, ATP pays, I think. Mm-hmm. ATP pays. Mm-hmm. Um, I was wondering um, what what was the mechanism of action there. Uh, I I didn't really catch that. Uh, I know AT ATP pays was used to um, move um, to move uh, potassium out against the gradient, but I want to know what exactly moved that potassium. Yeah. So so look, we we're gonna get to this a little more in depth, but since you asked, I'll ask, answer you now. We said cells are uh, bags of potassium in a sea of sodium, right? So that means there's a high concentration, high concentration 
of, of sodium is outside, there is high concentration of potassium inside, right? That's normal. And cell is usually, uh, before you have depolarization, inside of the cell is usually negative, maybe about negative 90 millivolts for your cardiac cell. Now, let, if you have, right, let's say on the cell membrane, you have these receptors, not receptors, you have channels, right? You have leaky channels. So let's say some sodium from the outside trickles in and it takes the resting membrane potential from negative 90 to negative, let's say 75 millivolts, which will be the threshold. And then when this occurs, your, your sodium gated channels open up and then a lot of sodium rushes in, right? That's where your depolarization is occurring, right? So now, right, depolarization is occurring, a lot of sodium is coming in. As this is going up, right, you will have potassium channels that open up and then potassium starts to leave the cell, right, to get to its equivalence point. So now what's happening? Now all of a sudden we have changes in the concentration. Before, before all these things began, we had high concentration of potassium inside and uh, high concentration of sodium outside. But now all of a sudden we are bringing, right, through these channels, we're bringing sodium inside with depolarization and we're throwing potassium out. How do we restore this gradient? The way we restore this gradient, we got to have the sodium potassium ATPases, right? So they're called sodium potassium ATPase. Why is it sodium potassium? Because we're moving uh, three sodium and two potassium against their concentration gradient. Why is it called ATPase? We're using ATP, adenosine triphosphate, right? When we break up uh, adenosine triphosphate into, right, into its phosphate and ADP, this is where it's high energy bond. And this is where we get our energy from. This is made in, AT, in mitochondria, by the way. Now, this ATP must be utilized here. Why? Because to restore this negative status, right, we have to take the sodium that's now inside the cell. We have to get it out. But still, there's high uh, sodium concentration outside. So sodium doesn't want to naturally leave the cell because it's still high amount of concentration of sodium surrounding it. So we have to employ ATP in order to drive this sodium out. And then we have to, again, employ the same ATP to now bring back this potassium that was here, right, that leaked out. We have to bring it back. And why do we need to bring it back? I want to restore this negative status of the cell, get it to the resting status so that I can trigger the next impulse. The way exactly. to restore it is via this pump. Okay, yeah. It's happening yeah. during rebullarization, correct? Yeah, correct, correct. Does that make sense? Yeah, I get it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and roughly speaking, right, uh, uh, your body uses about 25 to 30% of ATP energy that your mitochondria makes on these uh, ATPases, sodium potassium ATPases. Just imagine how much energy you need to do that, right? So, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get more in depth with this, right, uh, a little bit later. But uh, does, does it make sense now? Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. I was just trying to see um, where exactly that ATPase was. Like, where was it on, like, the, the cell oh, membrane? It's, it's located on the cell membrane of a lot of your cells. In the kidney yeah, cells, that, muscle cells, kidney cells, neuronal cells. A lot of cells that perform this function have this sodium-potassium ATPase in the membrane of the cell. Yep, yeah, right. I got it. Yeah. And this mechanism happening during rebullarization of the myocardial cell or whatever other cell that do, do the same thing. Correct. Correct, homie, right?